Hello everybody, my name is Mitchell Farmer and today we're going to be discussing Laboratory 2 of Refroblock covering the gluteal and perineal regions. I wanted to talk a bit about, before getting into the laboratory proper, the uh, hip and femur osteology as sometimes people find these topics confusing. The first I want to talk about is the ischium, taking us into that multicolor mode we should be familiar with now and rotating so we're looking at a posterior view of our model. I just wanted to point out a few landmarks. We have the ischial spine, this lime green segment right here, just inferior to that. We have a concavity known as the lesser sciatic notch, which is going to be an important boundary for the lesser sciatic foramen, I will discuss shortly. And then finally, we have the ischial tuberosity, the inferior most point of the ischium, and that would be what we sit on, the ischial tuberosity. So I'm going to exit out of that. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is some ligaments. So, there is the sacrotuberous ligament, highlighted here, and this extends from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity, which I one of the landmarks on the ischium I just pointed out. So, ischial tuberosity to the sacrum is the sacrotuberous ligament. Then, there's something known as the sacrospinous ligament, which extends from the ischial spine, seen here, to the sacrum. Now, the reason that these are important is that they help to find, or the reason that these ligaments are important other than structural reasons, is that they help to find the boundaries of the greater and lesser sciatic foramens. So I'm going to start us off with first discussing the boundaries of the greater sciatic foramen. The greater sciatic foramen has the ilium and the ischium superiorly and laterally. It has the sacrospinous ligament inferiorly and the sacrotuberous ligament medially. That would make it this dimensions. So the ilium, the ischium, sacrospinous ligament, sacrotuberous ligament, and this area here would be the greater sciatic foramen, which is going to be important as I discuss this lab. Inferior to that is the lesser sciatic foramen, which has the ischium laterally, and that lesser sciatic notch I pointed out earlier existing right here between the ischial spine and the ischial tuberosity has the sacrospinous ligament superiorly seen here and the sacrotuberous ligament both medially and inferiorly. And so just to spell it out for you, that would make the lesser sciatic foramen approximately here. I guess some notes on the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments. When you're doing the cadaveric dissection and you're cutting through gluteus maximus, be careful not to cut through the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments. Because as I've just pointed out, if you lose these ligaments, you're going to lose really important landmarks. You're not going to be able to define the greater and lesser static foramens, and you're going to have a hard time identifying everything else throughout the lab. So just be careful for that. Now finally, the last piece of osteology I want to talk about is the femur, taking us into that multicolor mode and taking us to a posterior view of the femur. We have the femur head, which is the part that articulates with the hip bones at the acetabellum, which is the area that the three hip bones can join. And then we have the femur neck, extending the femur head to the rest of the shaft. We have the greater trochanter laterally. It's an important point of muscle attachments I will show you shortly. And the lesser trochanter posterior medially. And then finally, there is in this lime green area, the gluteal tuberosity, which is an attachment point of gluteus maximus I've highlighted here. Just a special note, I'm going to exit this mode first, just a special note on the greater trochanter and the ischial tuberosities. So recall, this is ischial tuberosity, the part of the ischium we sit on, this is the greater trochanter. So the relative distance of the trochanters to each other doesn't change throughout adulthood, and nor does the relative distance of the ischial tuberosities to each other. It really doesn't change much at all. However, as we put on weight and we add soft tissue around the trochanters, the apparent distance between the trochanters might change because you're gaining soft tissue outward. And so this can make a pip, the hips appear wide to varying degrees. 
but despite this change in appearance, there really isn't that much change in the actual bony structure. Okay? So now that we've covered that osteology quickly, I'm going to move us on to looking more so at the gluteal region as it is in the lab. The first thing I want to talk about is gluteus maximus. So gluteus maximus can be seen on the model's right, and just to orientate you, this is a posterior view of the model. This is the issue in which I pointed out previously, and here is the femur. So this highlighted is gluteus maximus. It arises from the posterior surface of the ilium, highlighted here, the sacrum, highlighted here, and the surface of the sacroiliac ligaments, which can be seen on the model's left, and sacrotuberous ligament also can be seen here. It inserts onto the gluteal tuberosity, which is just on the posterior aspect of the femur, which I showed you earlier, and into the iliotibial tract on the lateral thigh. So this is the iliotibial tract, and I'll discuss it more in MSK, but essentially it connects all the way down to the tibia on the tibia's lateral condyle. Now, the action and the blood supply and the innervation of the gluteal muscles, those will all be discussed in MSK, but for now, just orientate yourself to how they kind of fit in with the rest of the anatomical picture of the pelvis. So, underneath gluteus maximus is gluteus medius, which can be seen on the model's left highlighted here. It extends farther superiorly than gluteus maximus, even though that isn't well shown on this model. But unlike gluteus maximus, it essentially extends all the way up to the iliac crest, which would be right here. Its proximal attachment is the posterior surface of the ilium between the an anterior gluteal line and the iliac crest. So this is the po proximal attachment of, of the ilium highlighted here. And its distal attachment is the superior surface of the greater trochanter of the femur. Recall that this is the greater trochanter of the femur, and it is an attachment point of gluteus medius, as well as, if I hide this, gluteus minimus also attaches to the greater trochanter. As is apparent, it is deep to gluteus medius, and its fibers are run parallel to it, and thus it has the same action as it, but it is just shorter. Its attachment point is proximal, or its attachment point, sorry, is inferior to the anterior gluteal line, while gluteus medius is, is superior. And the, anterior, the uh, anterior gluteal line will be better seen on the cadaver. Unfortunately, I can't really show it to you on the osteology of the ilium here. So both gluteus medius and gluteus minimus are commonly referred to as the lesser gluteals, and they have a critical role to play during the support phase of human walking. Once again, you'll learn more about that in MSK. But the final muscle I want to talk about, as far as the gluteal region is concerned, is the piriformis muscle. So the piriformis, its proximal attachment site, if I just rotate us so we're having an anterior view of our model, the proximal attachment site is the anterior lateral portion of the sacrum. So here's the sacrum, and it, on its anterior and lateral surface, piriformis attaches, and then exits through the greater sciatic foramen, as I showed you earlier, in order to uh, attach onto the greater trochanter of the femur. Now, as it passes through the greater sciatic foramen, it effectively divides the greater sciatic foramen into superior and inferior parts. And thus, it is an important landmark for organizing vessels and nerves of the gluteal region. Those vessels and nerves that emerge superior to the piriformes are, have superior in their name, like the superior gluteal vessel or the superior gluteal nerve. Those that emerge inferior are the inferior gluteal nerve and the inferior gluteal vessels, both the vein and artery, although I only have the artery present in this model. And I guess just a final note on piriformes, it is a lateral hip rotator, but once again, we'll discuss that more in MSK. So I'm going to move on to talking a bit about the pudendal artery now, highlighted here. I'm going to zoom us in a little bit. So the pudendal nerve, if I rotate us anteriorly, you can see that I still have it highlighted here. The pudendal nerve arises from the ventral primary rami of S2, 3, and 4 
um, which is part of the sacral plexus. So this is S2 spinal nerve, S3 spinal nerve, and S4 spinal nerve. And those all make contributions to help form the pudendal nerve. It is a good example of how things leave the pelvis to enter the perineal region. Basically, you can see it exiting through the greater sciatic foramen and then entering the perineal region through the lesser sciatic foramen. And a whole bunch or several blood vessels and nerves do this. And so it's a kind of an important trend to um, take note of. Essentially what it does is it innervates the skin and the glands of the penis and the clitoris as well as innervates a whole bunch of different muscles and stuff like that. All of which I'm going to be discussing when I pull up another model here in a second. But the other stuff I want to discuss just relative to this model are the inferior gluteal vessels. Which as noted they, in, they emerge um, inferior to the piriformis muscles and supply muscles of the gluteal region and the superior gluteal vessels which also supply muscles of the gluteal region. And then I wanted to put in the sciatic nerve just because you will for sure see it because as you can see in this model it is massive it's the largest per peripheral nerve in the body um, and it's actually a composition of two nerves but we'll be discussing that more in MSK. I just wanted to put it in so that you could see how big it is and it's going to be quite evident emerging inferior to the piriformis muscle or occasionally piercing the piriformis muscle as it travels inferiorly and exiting via the greater sciatic foramen. So I'm just going to pull up another model for us here. The ischiorectal fossa is what we're on now. Um, I want to discuss its boundaries before I finished off on talking about the pudendal nerve. So the ischiorectal fossa basically is this space right in here, approximately. Superiorly, there is the pelvic diaph diaphragm, which includes the levator ani and coccygeus muscles. I think it might actually be better shown over here. Includes the um, iliococcygeus and levator ani muscles. Medially, you have the external anal sphincter. This is the anal canal, but the external anal sphincter would be approximately here. Laterally, you have the obturator internus muscle, as well as obturator fascia, which isn't really well shown here, but would be present approximately in or just around the obturator internus muscle, as well as the tuberosity of the ischium is also the medial boundary. And then finally, inferiorly, we would have the um, perennial muscles. And everything that exists between those is the ischial rectal fossa. So on to the path and branches of the pudendal nerve. So recall that the pudendal nerve is here, emerging inferior to the piriformis muscle, exiting via the greater sciatic foramen and re-entering the perineal region via the lesser sciatic foramen. It has three important branches, and I'm gonna try and address them moving proximally to distally. First, we have the inferior rectal branch highlighted here, which innervates the external anal sphincter musculature and the skin around the anus. So if you had damage to the pudendal nerve and that damage also managed to damage the inferior rectal nerve downstream, then you could have a failure of the external anal sphincter of the um, anal canal, and then you could have fecal incontinence. So if we continue proximally along the pudendal nerve, the next nerve we're going to come across of is the perine perineal nerve, which would exist in the ischial rectal fossa. So the perineal nerve, as you might guess, supplies the perineum, but it has superficial and deep branches. The superficial branch, if we follow here, becomes the posterior scrotal nerve in men. Whereas in women, it becomes the posterior labial nerve and supplies the posterior skin of the scrotum, which would exist approximately here. So that's the superficial perineal nerve. The deep perineal nerve, which in this model is just shown to be a continuation of the perineal nerve, supplies the musculature of the perineum as well as the musculature of the pelvic diaphragm. And this is kind of where um, 
the pedonal nerve gets this catchy little saying, the S2, S3, S4, keep your ass off the floor. And that's because S2, S3, S4 spinal nerves help create the pudendal nerve. And then the pudendal nerve supplies, via the perineal nerve, the levator A9 muscles, which literally hold up all of your pelvic contents. And so if those didn't have innervation, they would essentially let your pelvic contents spill downwards and wouldn't keep your ass off the floor, so to speak. So that's the perineal nerve. Um, and it's two branches, the deep and superficial branches. The final terminal branches of the pudendal nerve vary between men and women. First, I'm going to rotate us anteriorly, where we have the dorsal nerve of the penis. This would be the terminal branch of the pudendal nerve in men, whereas the terminal branch of the pudendal nerve in females would be the dorsal nerve of the clitoris. Now, how the pudendal or how the pudendal nerve kind of travels and splits into all those branches is once it enters the perineum in this in the ischial rectal fossa it travels through something known as alcox canal or the pudendal canal which would exist approximately right here and what where that kind of canal is is it travels through obturator internus fascia so obturator internus is these two highlighted muscles and the pudendal nerve would travel through the fascia of that muscle as it's traveling through the ischial rectal fossa and as it's giving off the relevant branches I've already highlighted. And that would kind of be its path. And so when you're searching for it in the lab, first start at the sacrum, inferior to piriformis, through the lesser sciatic foramen, through the fascia of obturator internus, which is pudendal, the pudendal canal. A couple other important things that run through the pudendal canal include the internal pudendal artery and internal pudendal vein. So here's the internal pudendal artery and here's the internal pudendal vein. And you can see how they're all kind of bunched up here. And that's because they would all be traveling through the pudendal canal together. So that's basically the end of the lab. Um, the ischial rectal fossa, the pudendal, all of the relevant muscles basically covered. So I hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you for the next video.